In 1963, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Dan Murphy had done it. A text editor and programmed to write other programs that could run on the Digital Equipment Corporation's PDP-1. It was called Tico, the Tape Editor and Corrector. Later on, it would be known as the Text Editor and Corrector. According to Murphy, Punched paper tape was the only medium for the storage of program source on our PDP-1. There was no hard disk, no floppy disk, no magnetic tape or network. And well, the Tico, at the time, was pretty good at editing text. Tico was developed with extensibility in mind using those same small programs called macros. The programs would search and change text based on what macro was in use, and it was very, very good at searching. This was made necessary as the expensive typewriter or flexo writer printouts had no line numbers. This meant context was the only way to find and correct mistakes on the storage tape. In 1965, Tico 6 compatible with the PDP-6, brought with it visual editing, headed up by Richard Greenblatt, Jack Holloway, and Stuart Nelson. In 1972, Tico was reported to the PDP-10 by Carl Mickelson with the help of Richard Greenblatt. It had almost 400 macros run by commands that would need to have been memorized or looked up. In 1976, Fred Wright's E editor out of the AI lab of Stanford University implemented WYSIWYG editing. You saw what was in the file as you typed it. At this time, Richard Stallman took a vacation to Stanford University. He looked at Fred Wright's E editor and decided that Tico needed it. But Soon after returning to MIT, Stallman found that Carl Mickelson had created Control-R, a similar feature to E's WYSIWYG editor. However, it only used five lines of the screen, which made it inefficient. Stallman rewrote the macro to use the entire screen. Another standout feature of E was that it could also write anywhere to the file, as opposed to Tico's sequential editing. But instead of copying E's ability to put a file on disk in a way that allows for random reads and random writes, Stallman's effort simply read the entire file and any edits into a single buffer. As impressive as these features, command sets, and macros were, they weren't the only sets floating around. The Tico hacker environment was getting a little cluttered. TACMAC, TMAX, RMOD, DOC, and macros all did amazing things, but gradually, it happened. Guy Steele called it a Tower of Babel effect. One hacker, sitting at another hacker's terminal, would spend most of their initial time figuring out what macros were bound to what functions. It was time to bring things back together again. Guy Steele began the process, and after dealing with Richard Stallman looking over his shoulder, he asked him to help tackle the problem. Steele said, I did the first 0.001% of the implementation. Installment did the rest. Once finished, it was named Emacs by Stallman, short for Editing Macros. The macros part of the name was natural, but the E was chosen simply because the incompatible time-sharing operating system at the time didn't have many programs starting with E. Wanting to keep things open, but also wanting to avoid the Tower of Babel effect, Stallman added a line to the source code of Emacs. You were free to modify and redistribute the code only on the condition that you gave back any extensions made. The acceptance of these terms meant that you were joining the Emacs commune. There were many Emacs before Stallman and Steele's version. In 1976, EIN, which stands for EIN is not Emacs by Dan Weinreb. And in 78, Multics Emacs by Bernie Greenberg, written in MacLisp, and ZWI, 
which stands for Zwei Was Ein Initially by Dan Weinreb and Mike McMahon. But one version of Emacs, Gosling Emacs for Unix by James Gosling, also called Gosmax or Gmax, released in 1981, changed the course. Stallman claims that he had gotten permission to reuse the code from Gosling's Emacs, as initially, Gosling permitted unrestricted redistribution to those that helped, which led him to reuse some of the code. In 1983, Stallman had taken on another challenge, the GNU project. GNU stands for GNU's Not Unix. It's a free software collaborative project which was meant to give users unprecedented freedom over code that runs on their computer. You can run the GNU software, copy it, distribute it, read the source code, and modify it. Thus, Stallman's Emacs became GNU Emacs, and the free software movement was started. In 1985, on March 20th, GNU Emacs 13 was released as its first public showing. The next month, on April 10th, Emacs 15.10 was released, but not long after, a company called Unipress that had begun to distribute and sell Gosling's Emacs on Unix and VMS back in 83 said that Stallman never received the unrestricted redistribution promise and should cease distribution of GNU Emacs immediately. Stallman couldn't find the email from Gosling that mentioned his rights to redistribute, and that gave Unipress the upper hand. So Stallman set about rewriting any and all Gosmax code. In a more recent interview in 2013 via Slashdot, Richard Stallman said, The last piece of Gosmax code that I replaced was the serial terminal scrolling optimizer. A few pages of Gosling's code, which was preceded by a comment with a skull and crossbones, meaning that it was so hard to understand that it was poison. I had to replace it, but worried that the job would be hard. I found a simpler algorithm and got it to work in a few hours, producing code that was shorter, faster, clearer, and more extensible. Then I made it use the terminal commands to insert or delete multiple lines as a single operation, which made screen updating far more efficient. On July 15th, Emacs 16.56 was released and the final bits of Gosling's code was removed to satisfy Unipress's demand. On September 19th, Emacs 16.60 released with its first patches from the internet. And on October 4th, the Free Software Foundation is born to support 70s hacker culture and the free software movement born of the GNU project. The FSF initially employed developers to write software for the project, which was all licensed under various versions of the GNU public license. December 20th, the first version of Emacs 17, 17.36, was released. Initial work on the 18 series began in October of 1986, but it wasn't until March 22nd, more than a year since the first version of the 17 series, that Emacs 18.41 was released and would be the last major release for quite a while. In 1987, Epoch, the self-described enhanced GNU Emacs with a better interface, began by Alan Carroll. In 1990, the Association for Computing Machinery granted the Grace Murray Hopper Award to Richard Stallman for pioneering work in the development of the extensible editor Emacs. In 1991, Richard Gabriel of Lucid Inc. had hired several people, including one of the key GNU Emacs developers that Stallman credits for delays in 19's release to fork and write improvements to GNU Emacs. Stallman claims he was never informed of the fork or improvements until Lucid Inc. wanted to merge the features back into GNU Emacs. Stallman wanted only portions of the code rather than all. And this led to the full release of Lucid Emacs and left Stallman to implement the missing features into GNU Emacs himself. It was also around this time that Linux hackers took to using the GNU tools, including Emacs, in their own systems. 
At this point, Linux was arguably more GNU than Linux, which was the impetus for the infamous Stallman quote. <clears throat> I'd just like to interject for a moment. What you're referring to as Linux is in fact GNU slash Linux, or as I've recently taken to calling it, GNU plus Linux. Linux is not an operating system unto itself, but rather another free component of a fully functioning GNU system made useful by the GNU core libs. Shell utilities and vital system components comprising the full OS as defined by POSIX. In 1992, under time constraints and after the development of GNU Emacs 19 was languishing, Richard Gabriel's Lucid Inc. needed version 19 to support their IDE Energize C++. Gabriel led what he thought at the time to be the basis of Emacs 19, but it was a disaster. No longer waiting on the FSF and $200,000 later, Lucid Emacs based on an Alpha 19 version of GNU Emacs was released. In 1994, May 27th, the last version of Lucid Emacs is released, and the last bits of Epoch were folded into the project. And on September 13th, Lucid Emacs is no more, as Lucid Inc. files for bankruptcy. With the Lucid trademark in legal limbo, the project was renamed to X Emacs, no relation to X11. On November 1st, and supporting multiple frames in X and hexadecimal editing, GNU Emacs 19.28 is released as the first official release in the 19 series. 1997, September 15th, Emacs 20.1 brought multilingual support. 2001, October 28th, Emacs 21.1 brought terminal color. Horizontal scrolling, mouse wheel, sound image, and initial Unicode support. In 2007, June 2nd, Emacs 22.1 brought GTK support, drag and drop, and current, at the time, macOS support. 2009, January 30th, this is the date of the last official release of X. Emacs at 21.4.22. And as far as Emacs goes, X Emacs was number two. And without Emacs, that leaves only one. June 2nd, Emacs 23.1 brought better font rendering, better Unicode support, support for PDF and PostScript files, and more macOS updates. 2012, June 10, Emacs 24.1 brought with it GTK3 support, bidirectional input, and native color theme support. 2013, June 23rd, a preview release of none other than X Emacs, codenamed Kale, based on 21.5, is released, but not a peep since. 2016, September 17th, Emacs 25.1 brought TLS certificate support, embedding native widgets inside buffers and electric quote mode. 2018, May 28th, Emacs 26.1 brought double buffering to reduce flickering on X, Google Drive, and 24-bit color support. In 2020, August 10th, Emacs 27.1 brought text shaping with harf buzz and image resizing and rotation support without leveraging image magic. 2022, April 4th, Emacs 28.1 brought native compilation of Lisp files and emoji support. September 12th, Emacs 28.2, the latest maintenance release is out as the last release before this recording. <laughs>